So firstly, on behalf of the Cancer Nurse Society of Australia, I'd really like to thank Ovarian Cancer Australia for partnering with us and allowing this forum to go ahead here today. So we have been here over the last few days having our 22nd annual Cancer Nurses Conference. And I would agree with Jane, there's lots of exciting things happening in, in the space for lots of cancers, but also ovarian cancer. And in particular relation to um, ovarian cancer nursing, there's some work being done by Dr Olivia Cook, who works here at Monash University, into the role of the specialist nurse um, in gynaecological cancer. So looking to see if there can be a um, streamlined role across the country for positions of women, nurses who can support women um, with gynaecological cancer diagnosis across the country. So thank you very much for allowing me this opportunity and thank you for allowing CNSA to partner with you to be here today. So as Jane said, um, I'm a clinical nurse consultant in gynae oncology and I'm based in New South Wales at the Hunter New England Centre for Gynaecological Cancer, which is in Newcastle, um, which is about two hours um, north of Sydney. And I've been in that position for 24 years. So um, whilst I can understand that as an ovarian cancer survivor or someone who's going through treatment for ovarian cancer, I'm sure you have a, an entirely different perspective than what I have as a nurse um, being on that journey with the women that I care for. So I'm you know, very open if you have some suggestions when we talk about side effect management of things that you've done made a difference, I would certainly be, um, be willing to hear that and be able to pass that on to the ladies that I care for as well. So first, we'll just give you a little bit of a background on ovarian cancer, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Ovarian cancer is the 10th most commonly diagnosed cancer in females in Australia in 2015. 1,365 new cases were diagnosed in Australia in 2015, and it's estimated that this year there'll be an increase and there'll be 1,510 new cases diagnosed in Australia. And the risk of a woman being diagnosed with ovarian cancer by her 85th birthday is currently one in 84 women in our country. There are different types of ovarian cancer and, and the one that we mainly hear about is epithelial ovarian cancer which is arising from the, the outside surface of the ovary and that occurs in 90% of ovarian cancer cases. The less common um, but unfortunately more aggressive types of cancer are the sex cord stromal tumours that arise from the um, hormone producing cells in our ovaries and the germ cell tumours that are, arise from the egg producing cells. And both the sex cord stromal and germ cell tumours of the ovary um, usually occur in younger women. So what I'm going to be talking about today is really um, in relation to epithelial ovarian cancer, which we refer to often as the garden variety of ovarian cancer. But then there's one thing that we are finding out with research that has been happening over the past years, is there is not just one type of ovarian cancer, that we are really now starting to um, do genetic testing and figure out exactly the type of cancer and really um, tailoring treatment to the individual diagnosis, not to just that one type of ovarian cancer. So epithelial ovarian cancer most commonly occurs in women over the age of 50 years, with the average age of diagnosis being about 64 years. And most women that are diagnosed do not have any identifiable risk factors. And there's only a 15% um, of genetic predisposition, and that includes the BRCA1 and 2 genes and also the HNPCC genes, which is the hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer gene or Lynch syndrome, which some of you may have heard of. Um, and if people have a genetic mutation in that HNPCC gene, they're not only at risk of ovarian cancer, but also endometrial breast and bowel cancers as well. So there, there becomes a lot of screening involved for those women who have that um, genetic mutation. And of course, we've all heard about the, the BRCA mutation in relation to Ange Angelina Jolie having um, prophylactic surgery because her mother did have a BRCA mutation. So unfortunately, um, ovarian cancer in 75% of women is diagnosed when it's at an advanced stage. And that's basically attributed to the fact that there is a lack of a reliable screening test. And I think one bit of information we certainly need to get out there to the general public is that the pap smear is not detecting ovarian cancer. We often think that we go along for our pap smear now that it's ever, or the cervical screening test now every five years that that's all we need to have done as a woman for our reproductive system. Um, and I think there needs to be a lot more education in relation to that. The other part of that is that often when we have a cervical screening test, doctors may not actually do a pelvic examination or an internal examination. So they, they may actually just be doing the screening test and not doing anything further in relation to that screening. The other thing that it's attributed to is the fact that there 
the absence of specific symptoms until the, the disease is well established. One of the surgeons that I work for always says that he has ovarian cancer on Boxing Day because he's eaten too much, he's got a bloated belly, he has difficulty going to the toilet. Firstly, he's a man, he's not going to have ovarian cancer, but those symptoms are so vague and so non-specific that you know, we can attribute them to a lot of things. The positive thing is that if the disease is diagnosed at an early stage, there is a 90% survival rate. But unfortunately, as I said, with the 75% being diagnosed at an advanced stage, that survival rate is a lot lower. Ovarian cancer is staged according to the FIGO guidelines, and basically the staging is looking at um, how far the disease has spread, whether at stage one it's limited to the ovaries um, or up to stage four where it's going way past both the ovaries and having distant metastases to other organs. So it's in the stage um, three and four group that we see the majority of the diagnosis of ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer treatment is, the decision is usually made on a, a multidisciplinary team discussion. And what a multidisciplinary team is, is a team of um, health professionals from all the disciplines. So you have your surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, pathologists, radiologists, nurses and allied health people, psychology, that are all involved in that decision making process where a team sits down and reviews the, the um, test results and the case of a particular woman and um, makes a recommendation for her treatment on, that, on those, dis those discussions. And the treatment, of course, has to be based on the stage of the disease, so how far it has spread, um, where it's actually located, whether it's going to be easy to be removed, the severity of the woman's symptoms. What have they presented with? Have they presented with just a couple of months of abdominal bloating or have, has this been going on for quite some time? Do they have ascites? Have they got fluid in their lungs, which is a pleural effusion? Of course, we also have to take into, into consideration women's other health problems. So we don't just come along with one disease. Often women come along with other comorbidities, such as diabetes, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, that may preclude um, them going ahead with some treatments. And of course, the most important thing is the woman's wishes. But the woman needs to be fully informed about what the recommendations and what the choices are before she can then make that informed decision. So treatment for ovarian cancer can be um, varied. It can include surgery, it can include chemotherapy, radiotherapy in some um, situations, targeted therapy that I was talking about, having really tailored treatment, and hormone therapy. So I'm going to go through each one of those for you today. Ovarian cancer surgery basically aims to remove as much of the cancer as possible without, with leaving minimal residual disease, what we call in, in medical speak, R0. So we want to get residual down to zero disease. So as much as we can remove um, that we can't, see with, we can't see anything with the naked eye. Surgery can be given up front or it can be what we call interval surgery after another type of treatment, which is usually chemotherapy. Often early stage disease ovarian cancer can be done with keyhole surgery or laparoscopy. But once it's um, progressed to those advanced stages of stages three and four, that becomes a lot more difficult and um, a laparotomy or a full cut into the abdomen is required. And the surgery is um, termed debulking surgery, which in, which in itself sounds pretty, <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty horrific to think that what, you know, and what it means is basically removing the bulk of the tumour. But to tell someone that you had a debulking really sounds quite, quite horrific. And it is, and it's, it's, it's a huge procedure to go through. And um, research has actually found that if that surgery really does need to be undertaken by a specialist gynae-oncologist in a, um, a multidisciplinary treatment centre where they have all the support of all the allied health professionals that go with that, that gynae-oncologist. Um, and I think we are getting better across Australia at doing that and we've actually seen that in outcomes have improved for women who are treated in those major centres. So what does a debulking surgery involve? So a midline laparotomy, a cut in the tummy. So it basically goes from your, um, just under your rib cage right down to your pubic bone, sometimes through the middle of your belly button. Sometimes they do a nice little circle around it to make it look, keep your belly button there. Um, a total abdominal hysterectomy, so removing your uterus. Bilateral salpingorephrectomy, removing your tubes and your ovaries. An omentectomy, removal of that fat layer that we all have that hangs down from our stomach called the omentum, where unfortunately ovarian cancer tends to um, spread and seed to. 
pelvic and paraortic lymph node dissection, so taking out the lymph nodes that drain from that um, reproductive organs, peritoneal biopsies and washings, so biopsies of anything that we can see that's abnormal, and washings, which means they throw a lot of fluid in your belly, wish it around, and suck it back out again, and then send that off to testing, just to see if there's any little cancer cells that have been um, found in that. It can also include diaphragmatic scraping, so scraping along the bottom of the diaphragm where, again, um, ovarian cancer can uh, place little seedlings. And it can sometimes also include bowel surgery and um, possibility of formation of a stoma. And in some cases, also a, um, a urostomy, which is a, a, a urine bag as well as a, a bowel bag. So it is really, really quite an extensive surgery. So as you would imagine, that really have to take into careful consideration the type of patient that we put through this type of surgery, because it it's, it's a big deal and um, women are usually in hospital for at least a week and it does take a lot of recovery if they have um, other comorbidities that they are coming along with. There are obviously uh, side effects that come with surgery, um, obviously pain, you've had a big cut in your tummy from here to here, um, that can be a big um, impact. In our unit, we use um, both patient-controlled analgesia, so the button where a patient can press for um, analgesia postoperatively. Some units use epidurals, um, and others use, we also use what's called tap blocks, so they're like a local anaesthetic, or we call it a sprinkler system just under the skin to provide some local anaesthetic at the actual um, wound site. And then after the few days, obviously that analgesia will be changed to oral medication that the patient can then go home on. Um, nausea after surgery due to, firstly, the pain medication and secondly, the anaesthetic medication. A lot of women can come to us and this can be the first surgery that they've undergone and they are what we call um, medication naive. So they haven't been one who take medication or pain relief all the time. So it can be a really big hit having a major anaesthetic and then these really quite heavy morphine related drugs. Um, so having to have medications, antiemetics to prevent that nausea and prevent vomiting is really important as well. And then going along with that, with all the, the pain relief as well as the anti-nausea medications, it can cause constipation. And we've also, when we've done your surgery, picked up your bowel, put it over to the side while they're doing everything else and then put it back in. So having, having that handling of the bowel can really affect how your bowel is functioning. It can take days. So you may have remembered that when doctors came in after your surgery, they'd be listening for bowel sounds all the time. That's really important so that we know that the bowel is functioning again. And sometimes that can take many days. And one of the important things that we ask people before they are allowed to leave hospital, have you passed wind? Have you had your bowels open? Um, sometimes the passing wind can take a few days and the bowels can take um, even longer. So having laxatives and, and medication and have continuing that on a long-term basis, especially if you're going home um, with pain relief as well. Uh, there can be difficulty urinating. Sometimes that can actually improve after surgery because this big mass may have been pressing on your ureters and your bladder, causing you to um, urinate all the time or not being able to urinate. But it can also be caused by having the catheter and just having that foreign body um, in your, in your um, body and inside your ureter. Lymphedema or swelling of the lower limbs um, can be caused if we're removing your pelvic lymph nodes. So basically our lymphatic system is removing all our waste products from our body and when we do remove some of those lymph nodes, the rest of our lymphatic system has to take up the slack that those lymph nodes that we've removed um, usually do and that can then result in some swelling um, in the lower limbs. So we provide education um, from our physiotherapists to our patients about the risk of lymphedema. And the risk of lymphedema, the statistics and the research done over the years say that lymphedema um, can be, you have a 20% to 70% risk. And everybody's different. We could take two lymph nodes out of one lady and we can take 20 lymph nodes out of another lady. She may not get lymphedema and she may. So it's really about your body and how well it, it responds to having those lymph nodes removed. But um, there is education we can provide as well as um, manual lymphatic drainage. So there is a technique that we can use to help manage that lymphedema. And obviously, as you would imagine, if you're in a job where you're on your feet, um, having that lymphedema can really affect your quality of life and your ability to be able to do your work. And the uh, other side effect of surgery is obviously menopausal symptoms. Um, depending on your age at the time of your diagnosis of ovarian cancer, when we remove your ovaries, you go into what we call a surgical menopause. So not like the majority of women who um, go through menopause at a slow pro progress um, and develop symptoms slowly over time. This is an instantaneous menopause, which as you can imagine for some women who've been through terrible menopause, it would be quite awful to have it all thrown at you at one time you know, to the point that day one post-operatively people are feeling hot flushes, night sweats. Um, 
and vaginal dryness and mood swings are, are part of those um, symptoms as well. And one thing that they've found over the last few years, it's really, really helpful because obviously a lot of these women um, who have ovarian can cancer, if they're having a hormone receptor positive cancer, can't have hormone re replacement therapy um, to deal with these menopausal symptoms. So low dose antidepressants um, really do work well in controlling some of those um, vasomotor symptoms or those hot flushes and night sweats. So they can be really, really helpful as well. Um, and as far as, it, obviously they would also then help with the mood swings and with vaginal dryness, there's lots of um, lubricants and gels that can um, be found at, at local chemists as well. And our psychologist is really um, fabulous in sort of helping women through those symptoms, being able to find ways to manage them as well. So now I'm going to go on to chemotherapy. Um, chemotherapy is basically the use of medicines to destroy cells which are rapidly dividing, which includes cancer cells. And chemotherapy can be upfront, or what we call neoadjuvant, um, which, does, which is to shrink the disease prior to surgery, which happens in advanced disease, or it can be adjuvant, which is to eliminate any cancer that remains after surgery. Um, there are multiple routes that um, chemotherapy can be given, but in ovarian cancer, it's mainly intravenous and intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Has anyone here had intraperitoneal chemotherapy? No, I don't know if they're doing it in Victoria. Uh, I'll explain what it is. Yeah, so intraperitoneal chemotherapy is basically when they put a tube directly into your abdomen at the time of surgery and they, they give the chemotherapy directly into your pelvic. Yeah, yes. The problem with, the, with um, IP chemotherapy is that it's not very well tolerated. People find that it, it really, the side effects are really quite dramatic and the nausea and vomiting is quite, um, quite distressing. And as you can imagine, if you had a big pelvic mass that's been removed and we're then putting litres of fluid back into your abdomen, it's really quite uncomfortable for some women. So even when we have started women on the intraperitoneal chemotherapy path, a lot of them aren't able to complete the full, full cycles. So it's, it's sort of not going, it's not in favour as much as it was when it first started. Um, so IV chemotherapy is the main, uh, the main thing for ovarian cancer. One good thing we know is that epithelial ovarian cancer is highly chemosensitive, so chemotherapy works. But again, it depends on the patient's performance status, how, how well you are other than that, any comorbidities or other um, diseases, patient choice, the toxicity or side effects or an allergic reaction to chemotherapy. Our standard first-line tra treatment for um, um, ovarian cancer is a platinum-based drug um, as a, a single agent or in a combination with a taxane. So carbotaxol is what we usually give for the majority of women. But again, that is really dependent. In, in an older patient who has, a, has other comorbidities, they will often only have single agent carboplatin and not add the paclitaxel because that really does, um, again, increase the side effects quite dramatically. As I said, it's given intravenous or intraperitoneally. And there are lots of different regimes. There can be um, three-weekly doses where you go every three weeks and have your chemotherapy or dose-dense where you have the carboplatin every three weeks and then you have the paclitaxel every week um, in between that as well. Um, and again, the dose-dense um, regime has actually not um, shown to have a great significant difference in, in the outcomes. So sometimes women can become a lot sicker having the dose-dense because you're having the chemotherapy that more frequently and you don't have time for your body to sort of regenerate between those three weekly cycles. And obviously treating within a clinical trial if it's available is also um, very important. I'm not going to talk too much about clinical trials so there is going to be another speaker speaking about clinical trials today. But they've found that um, having the close um, assessment and monitoring when you're on a clinical trial really does improve outcomes. So if there are clinical trials available, that's important to be um, a part of that as well. And your medical oncologist would, would refer you to those if there was anything that you would fit in to the, the criteria for. So the side effects of chemotherapy, it affects everybody individually, um, but most side effects are manageable. I know that when we first um, present to a woman that they may have chemotherapy, the story comes up, well, I had this friend 20 years ago and she was so, so sick and her hair fell out and she was, oh, was awful and she couldn't go to work and she couldn't get out of bed. Things have, things have changed dramatically over the last 20 years that I've been you know, doing this job in that the medications that we use um, to assist women to get through this have drastically improved. Um, as I said, most side effects are manageable. Some women may experience a few side effects and some many of these side effects, it's really as I said, individual. And the one thing to remember is that you, if you experience no side effects, it doesn't mean that the chemotherapy is not working. 
people say, I'm supposed to be feeling sick. Why aren't I feeling sick? You know? So it doesn't mean it's not working. It's just you're lucky and that you didn't get those side effects. And as I said, it has changed over many years. We're giving women med medications these days in the shape of steroids and anti-medical, anti-nausea medications prior to starting chemotherapy. So your body is already preparing to, um, to be, you know, have the, the chemotherapy or the toxic drugs put through you and your body is able to prepare for that and you're able to get through the side effects a lot easier. We have women who actually work through their chemotherapy. So um, it's very, very individual. There are lots of side effects of chemotherapy. Some of the common ones, of course, are nausea and vomiting, taste and smell changes, fatigue or tiredness, hair loss or alopecia, diarrhea or constipation, mouth ulcers and infections, otherwise known as mucositis, skin and nail changes or reactions, nerve and muscle problems such as peripheral neuropathy, and chemo brain or chemo fog. I'm going to go through all of them. And then there are the rarer side effects of chemotherapy. They're rare, but they can be serious and they definitely require medical attention. First one is neutropenia, which is infection due to a low level of white cells. Thrombocytopenia, bleeding or bruising caused by low platelets. Kidney or bladder problems, heart problems, bone marrow problems and allergic reactions. And as I said, these things are rarer, but they really do need close monitoring. And that's why, you know, the neutropenia and the thrombocytopenia, while you're having frequent blood tests, while you're having chemotherapy, so they can really keep an eye on that. Because if your immune system is low um, and you have low white blood cells and low platelets, then you are at risk of developing infection. And that's why they tell you to stay away from people who are unwell during the time that you're on chemotherapy. So nausea and vomiting, it's a common side effect, um, but it can be anticipatory feeling nervous or worried prior to chemotherapy. As you're driving up to the hospital, you're thinking, I'm going to be sick, I'm, I feel sick. And it's just that thought of starting chemotherapy. You've been there last time, you felt you were sick last time, it's happening again. It's that anticipatory feeling of, um, of having to undergo it. So what can help? Giving the steroids prior to chemotherapy, having the antiemetics or the anti-nausea drugs, Maxlon and Ondansetron are really helpful. And for that anticip in anticipatory vomit vomiting, Trying regular um, relaxation techniques and eating small, regular meals. Having a, a little pattern that you have in your head on the way to chemotherapy. If you're driving or if you're the passenger or you're on the train, have some sort of mindfulness um, activity where you can actually sort of focus on something that will take you away from thinking about where you're going and what you're having done. Um, and having easy, prepare, easy to prepare and bland foods, dry toast and biscuits, not having to... Um, prepare the meals that spill, smell too spicy or um, hot foods make you feel sick, really changing the way that you do things if you can to make things that are easy to prepare so that when you are feeling nauseous like that, you don't have to then be cooking a, a three-course meal for the rest of the family. Taste and smell changes. Unfortunately, sometimes food may lose its taste or taste different, and that includes foods that you love. Um, and usually this will improve over time, but people do complain about, you know, Foods that they did love all the time, they just can't stand anymore, which, yeah, <laughs> which is a bit sad. The things that can help with that are regular mouth care, um, having sugar-free gum or mints, um, trying to add sauces and herbs to your food um, to, you know, to change the flavour, and if you can, have someone else prepare your meals. I know that's not, not possible in all, in all cases, but sometimes it's just that cooking and, and preparing food that can make you feel quite, quite unwell and that... Uh, the smell, it can be really quite potent when you've had chemotherapy. Fatigue. Fatigue is very common when having chemotherapy and it can sometimes last three to six months after treatment. I'm sure some of you may say even longer. <laughs> um, but it can also be caused not only by the chemotherapy treatment by, but by from low blood, um, red blood cells or iron levels during treatment. So it's important when they're doing those regular blood tests that um, they're checking those as well that it may, you may not just be anemic um, that it, the fatigue is truly coming from the chemotherapy. So how can we help in this situation? By prioritising our activities, figuring out on a daily basis what is it that's really important that I ne get, need to get done today, what can be left till tomorrow, um, and doing things sort of one at a time, getting up, doing an activity, and then having a rest. Organising if you can, or getting you know the, your local nurses who support you to organise practical help prior to starting chemotherapy. I know in our area we have lots of support services who were able to put in place for women um, to support them during this time, whether that be with house cleaning, driving kids 
to and from activities, things like that. We have um, a very good support group called, um, it's called Stop Ovarian Cancer, um, a local group who are able to do things like this for women all the time, which is really, really helpful in some situations. Um, having naps, but only having short naps, because if you find that you are fatigued during the day and then you have a big sleep, then you're up all night and not able to sleep at night time. So just having short naps just to give you that little bit of an energy boost. A bit of a nana nap in the afternoon is, is, is good. Um, and they've also found, re re recent research has found that exercising during and after treatment can help you feel less tired, improves your sleep, your body image and your mood. We all think, you know, if I'm feeling tired, I should lay down. But actually going out and having a walk um, can actually make you feel better and doing some exercise. There's lots of studies going on in this space at the moment about um, exercising during treatment. Um, and that actually in includes in some centres, you know, being on an exercise bike while your chemotherapy is being delivered yeah so there's lots of lots of they're really finding that exercise is making a big difference and it can also improve yeah <laughs> can you imagine doing that <laughs> a treadmill okay yeah whatever whatever works maybe okay <laughs> no, yeah yeah i actually just talked previously before coming in here um was from an exercise physiologist and she said that we should all be, and this is, this is well people as well as people with diagnosis of cancer, 150 minutes of um, aerobic exercise per week plus two to three ses sessions of resistance exercise per week. That's a lot. I don't do that and I'm fit and healthy and well. So I think it's really, you know, it's really hard to then expect a patient who's had a diagnosis with cancer to get to those levels. But the main message from that is avoid inactivity. Do something, even if it's just a walk around the block or walk down the street, it's better than just sitting on the lounge and doing nothing. So when you do feel tired, having that little short walk, getting up and out of the house into some fresh air can really change your whole mindset and actually help, help the way you feel. Hair loss or alopecia. Um, this can start two to three weeks after the first chemo and can be, can, um, be from mild thinning to total hair loss. And that doesn't just include hair on your head, it includes body hair. And I think some, that's one thing that women often come back to me going, I didn't realise it was all going to fall out, you know, not just the hair on my head. Um, and that can, you know, really have a, a big impact on a woman's self-esteem and body image. Um, and again, it may grow back differently um, to the hair that you had prior. Some people say it grows back thicker, thinner, curlier, straighter. Um, and as I said, it affects women's body image and sexuality um, at a time when you're not feeling particularly um, self-confident in, in what's happening with you anyway. So what can help? Um, the cold cap or school, uh, scalp cooling treatment. Does anybody have undergo the scalp cooling treatment here? Yeah. Were you able to tolerate that? No, no. Didn't work, yeah. Didn't work, yeah. And it, yeah, <laughs> perfect, yeah. So again, it, it's, it's very individual and what that is doing is actually dilating the, um, the blood vessels in your head so the chemotherapy doesn't actually go to that area. But again, it's, it's very individual as to whether it will work and not all women can, um, can tolerate the, the coldness of it. So um, if it does work, it's great, but not always. Um, another suggestion is getting your hair cut short prior to treatment so that when your hair does start to fall out, it's not such a big shock, especially if you have long hair to start with. Um, using, using gentle hair products wearing a scarf or a wig or a hat. Um, lots of hospitals have wig libraries and um, things like that that they can help you with that. And being taking part in the Look Good Feel Better program. Has anybody done that? Yeah. Yep. It's fun, isn't it? It's lots of fun. Yeah, yeah. Really does. It makes you feel good about yourself and gives you ideas of ways that you can sort of make you build back that self-confidence and body image that you had prior. Um, which is great. I participated, CNSA, CNSA years and years ago at a conference like this did put on a workshop where the nurses could actually go and participate in the program and that was fabulous to just be able to see what it is that um, the, the, the consumers are experiencing when they go to that program. It really does make a difference. Um, diarrhea and constipation um, can be caused by chemotherapy or antiemetics, as I was saying before. Um, and it can develop as you're also less active and um, are eating less during treatment. Um, what can help with this? Medication such as anti-diarrhea medication if you're having diarrhea or laxatives if you're becoming constipated. Drinking more water. I'm supposed to drink eight glasses a day but I don't do that either. Um, <laughs> but it is important, especially when you're having chemotherapy to sort of flush, flush everything through as well. Um, for constipation, eating more fruit and vegetables and again, exercising. And for diarrhea, avoiding spicy foods, avoiding dairy products. 
um, and also high fibre foods and coffee. Mucositis can include mouth ulcers, infection, bleeding gums and thrush in the mouth. And this usually occurs about five to ten days after starting chemotherapy. The things that can help with that are brushing your teeth and gums with a very soft toothbrush after every meal. Um, and that also decreases the risk of infection if you have food particles still left in your mouth. Having that really um, cleaned and rinsed out well is good. Trying bland and soft foods and avoiding extremes of hot and cold. Um, there are lots of analgesic gels or sodibic mouthwashes that can help relieve some of that discomfort and just basic pain relief things like Panadol um, and in some circumstances dissolving the Panadol and swishing it around your mouth can help as well as, as, as just um, swallowing the Panadol. Skin and nail changes or reactions. Women can sometimes have a red... Yeah, <laughs> still got it? Red bumpy rash or dry itchy skin, your nails may become darker, develop ridges and lines, become brittle or flaky. Um, what can help? I guess with the rash, rash and the dry itchy skin, non-perfume moisturisers like sorbolene, using sun protection when you are out in the sun, avoiding getting scratches from cats and dogs and being in the garden, those sorts of things, wearing clothes that protects you, um, keeping your, your nails clean and short. Um, and wearing gloves when you're washing up, gardening or doing, uh, doing heavy housework so that you're not sort of um, having those exposed. Nerve and muscle problems can um, extend from either just muscle and joint pain and stiffness or changes in sensation in the hands and feet called peripheral neuropathy. Now peripheral neuropathy um, usually presents as tingling, pins and, needle, pins and needles, um, numbness and pain, and it makes it very difficult to do everyday fine motor activities. So if you're someone who likes to sew um, or write or do those sorts of things that they're using their hands all the time, it, it does become really quite difficult. Um, and also with your feet it does become difficult. Wearing shoes is quite painful as well. Um, with the muscle and joint stiffness, you can use a heat pack to the affected area. Um, again, protecting your hands and feet um, by wearing gloves, oven mitts and shoes in the garden. And if you can, getting assistance with some of those activities that um, you aren't able to do because you can't, you know, can't get the, jar, the lid off the jar, those sorts of things become a bit more difficult when you don't have that proper sensation in your fingers and your hands. Chemo brain and chemo thought. This is um, chemotherapy-related cognitive impairment. You might be unable to concentrate, feeling unusually disorganised when you're usually a very organised person, a trouble with your memory. Um, it should usually improve once treatment finishes, but again, I've heard stories of it continuing for quite some time and never quite coming back to what it was originally. Um, there's research going on into why this happens as well and looking into ways that, that we can improve this um, for patients who are having chemotherapy. What can help? We can write lists and notes and diary. I know that in my working day, if I don't have post-it notes stuck on everything, things don't get done. So, you know, it, it, it can help. Um, having others help to, you to remember things. Keeping a calendar on the fridge, having your, your phone with your little diary in there and things um, ding up when something's due or when you need to do something. Undertaking activities to keep your mind active, like Sudoku, um, word searches, crossword puzzles, those sorts of things to keep your mind. There's lots of apps on your phones these days that have lots of sort of mind, mind games that you can, you can um, get in there and play to keep your mind active as well. And as I said, there is lots of research happening in this area. Neutropenia, so getting on to some of the, the rarer but more, more serious side effects. Um, neutropenia is a decreased level of white blood cells, um, and, or they're, they're called the neutrophils. And what neutrophils do is actually help us to fight infection. So obviously, um, if we have a decreased level of neutrophils, then we are at increased risk of infection. That can be life-threatening in some situations. To help with that, we need to obviously wash our hands and do regular mouth care. Um, take your temperature. I'm sure you've all been sent home after chemotherapy with your thermometer and told that if you get to a temperature of over 38, you need to present back to your local hospital straight away and not wait. Um, again, limiting contact with sick people and learning to recognise those signs of infection, which I'm sure are all drummed into you when you go to your chemotherapy education, your temperature above 38, chills, fevers, sweats, sore throat, cough, uncontrolled diarrhoea, shortness of breath, fast heart rate, or just feeling unwell. And you know, it's, it's um, not advisable sort of to wait, think, oh, it'll go away. It's just, it's, it's just something and it'll go away. It's best to pre present early where these things can be treated and be put on antibiotics straight away if need be. 
Thrombocytopenia is the other one, which is a decreased level of platelets. Um, what platelets do is to help clot our blood. Um, and then obviously if our blood isn't clotting properly, we're at an increased risk of bleeding and bruising. How can we help this? Um, again, having a blood test regularly between chemotherapy cycles, avoiding bruising or cutting yourself if you can, avoiding contact sport or vigorous exercise, um, blowing your nose gently. That's one of the big things is having um, no nose bleeds when you're on chemotherapy if you have low platelets. Um, avoiding constipation, so not having that straining, using the laxatives on a regular basis so that you're not straining, causing you may have bleeding from your bowel, using a soft toothbrush to prevent your gums from bleeding, and again, if you have uncontrolled bleeding, going to the hospital straight away. Okay, we'll move on to radiotherapy. Radiotherapy is basically the use of high energy X-rays or radiation to stop cancer cells from growing. It's not commonly used to treat ovarian cancer. Um, it's said that only about 5% of ovarian ca cancer patients will um, have radiotherapy, and it's usually used in the setting to help relieve symptoms such as bleeding, pain or discomfort, and it can also be used at the time of recurrence. The side effects of radiotherapy often begin two to three weeks into treatment, but can be managed and will gradually improve after the radiotherapy is completed. Um, they include skin problems, fatigue, loss of appetite, nausea and vomiting, diarrhoea and urination problems. So some things that are certainly similar to um, the chemotherapy side effects. And again, the ways that we can help with that are the same as the ways we can help with chemotherapy related side effects. The main thing with the skin problems is um, a burn. So basically having radiotherapy is like getting a quite a severe sunburn. There are lots of topical creams and treatments that can be used these days to help with that, um, that skin irritation that can occur with that. Um, again, fatigue, loss of appetite, nausea and vomiting, diarrhoea, they're all similar, very similar to the, the side effects. But as I said, only a very small group of, of women with ovarian cancer will have radiotherapy and it's really about symptomatic relief as opposed to um, a treatment for, for ovarian cancer in itself. Then we move on to targeted therapies. Um, targeted therapies are basically treatment with medicines that are specifically designed to kill cancer cells without damaging normal cells. So while we know that chemotherapy and radiotherapy can also damage some of our normal cells, these targeted therapies are really just basically targeted at the cancer cells. There are two different types that are, that are being used in um, ovarian cancer at the moment. One of them is called a monoclonal antibody, um, and that drug is called bevacizumab, and the other is a PARP inhibitor, and that drug is called a laparib. So a monoclonal antibody um, belongs to a group of drugs called an angiogenesis inhibitor. And basically what they do is prevent the formation of new blood vessels needed for the cancer to grow. A laparib or a PARP inhibitor is used for women who have a genetic mutation in their BRCA genes. And it prevents tumour cells with a mutation in the BRCA gene from repairing themselves. And in the ovarian cancer setting, it's used in maintenance, treatment or recurrence. Question? Yep. And they've just opened up a lot for me. So it's a very recent thing. I think yep. it's the beginning of the year. So I just thought I'd point that out. Fantastic. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Yes. So the, yeah. That's right. So when we're talking about BRCA gene mutations, you can either have a germline tumour, which is in your genetic history, or you can have a somatic mutation where the mutation is just actually in your tumour. So that, that trial that you're about to be on is for those where they have the mutation in their tumour only and not in their germline BRCA gene. Yeah. So yeah, the cells in your tumour have a mutation just in those cells, but that, that BRCA gene in the rest of your body doesn't have that mutation, it's just in the tumour. So that's... They're hoping that that will work on that. They know that it works on the, ge the germline BRCA mutation. We're hoping that it'll work on this somatic germline mutation. So that's why these things are targeted. We can actually look at your tumour and see if you have a mutation in your tumour, even if you don't have a mutation in your germline or your genetic um, path. Hmm? There is, absolutely. Look, it's changing. It's changing all the time. It's a tablet. Yep. 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 
Have you been on the capsules or the tablets? Yep. And because they brought it out in tablet form and you only have to take two rather than eight, I can use one for just much more fun for me to do it that way. Yeah. <laughs> so I've gone, the only difference is the capsules are like 400 milligram dose a day, the tablets, because their tablets are 100, uh, 300, 300 milligrams a day, twice a day, they're much more manageable yeah. than the capsules. And, you know, that's my life. Yeah. Yep. And I think that's, that's the big difference is that, yeah, for women who, when they first started with Elaparib, were taking 16 tablets a day. When you're feeling sick... And you're rather tablets. And everything else that you're on as well, you know, 16 tablets, you can't even, you can't even look at that. To now have changed to a, um, sorry, capsules, changed to a tablet now that's, that's two tablets twice a day is a lot more palatable. Um, the thing is with a laparib though that the capsules and the, and the, um, tablets aren't interchangeable because they are different doses. The capsules were a 400 milligram capsule, the tablets are a 300 milligram tablet, so it's, it, there's a, um, a bit of a crossover for women who have been on the capsules to, to change across to the tablets, but they're seeing some, some benefit of that as well. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Bevacizumab, or the other name is Avastin, is often added to chemotherapy if we have what's called a suboptimal debulking. So we've got residual disease of greater than one centimetre. So with their naked eye, they can still see disease left behind at the time of surgery. Um, the side effects of Bevacizumab are increased protein in the urine, which we don't usually know about, um, it, which may have, bevacizumab may affect wound healing. So to add bevacizumab into chemotherapy, it can't be within four to six weeks after surgery or people often have wound breakdowns. It can cause an incre increased risk of bleeding. It can cause bleeding into the bowel or the stomach, which is called a gastrointestinal perforation. It can cause, thrombo cause thromboembolism, which is in the form of either a clot in the lungs, a, a PE, a DVT or a deep vein thrombosis, or a CVA or a stroke. It can cause hypertension, and it can cause something called reversible posterior leukoencephalopathy syndrome, which is a rare neurological disorder, which can present with headaches, seizures, lethargy, confusion, and blindness. Obviously, that's very rare, but it is one of the side effects. So don't be put off by that, because that happens in like you know less than 1% of people who have bevacizumab. But it has shown to um, increase the... Um, overall survival um, when that's added to the carboplatin and paclitaxel. A laparib or limpasa that we've been talking about, some of the side effects of that are nausea and vomiting, but they say that actually has very low um, what we call um, a metagenic effect, so not much nausea and vomiting with that. And it usually the, the worst time for that is when you in, within the first month of starting treatment is when it's worst, but that does improve over time. You're agreeing? <laughs> yep. Um, again... Yes, <laughs> that can help. <laughs> Taste and smell alterations, the neutropenia, the low neutrophils, from thrombocytopenia, the low platelets, diarrhoea, fatigue, anemia, low blood count or iron level, and sometimes it can cause lung problems, but again, that side effect is, is really quite rare. So as I said, there's, there's, there's lots of studies going on in this space, and this, the um, inclusion of a, a laparib on the PBS, which was in 2017... 16? February 2017. 17. Um, has really made a huge difference. That was the first big change in ovarian cancer treatment in 30 years. Before that, we were doing the same thing for years. So that was really, that has really made a big difference. And if we can see that that is going to have an, we know that it has an impact on those germline BRCA tumours, but if it does have an impact from these studies that are being done now on those other somatic um, mutations, then it really will make an even bigger difference than it's already making, which is great. Another type of ther therapy that we can use in ovarian cancer is hormone therapy, and that's basically the use of hormone medications to block the action um, of the hormones. It's rarely used in epithelial ovarian cancer. It's more likely used in those other types of ovarian cancer, the stromal tumours, which arise from the hormone-producing cells. Um, and the types of drugs that are used are things called the luteinizing hormone releasing hormone, or LHRH, selective estrogen receptor moderators, or SERMs, and aromatase inhibitors, or AIs. And basically what they do is they prevent estrogen from stimulating the cancer cell growth by either reducing the levels of estrogen or acting as an anti-estrogen. So the SERMs, or the selective estrogen receptor modulator, one of the examples of that is tamoxifen, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Everyone, who, when you have breast cancer, you often go on to that as a maintenance therapy after breast cancer diagnosis um, has also been used in this group of um, ovarian cancer patients. 
Some of the side effects can include headache, fluid retention and swelling, joint pain and stiffness, muscle aches, blood clots, those DVTs in the lung clot PE, um, possible stroke, and also they can um, cause changes to endometrial, um, the endometrial cells of the lining of your uterus, if you still have a uterus, um, and also endometrial cancer. We often have women that are referred to our service who've had breast cancer who are on tamoxifen long-term treatment who then have some endometrial um, changes and ha end up having some vaginal bleeding that then need to have those investigated. It's usually just a side effect of the tamoxifen treatment. Um, and then those aromatase inhibitors, arimidex or anastrozole are the drugs that are used there. And the side effects of those um, include joint stiffness, joint pain, some heart problems, osteoporosis, and sometimes broken bones. And that just goes with the, the thinning of the, of the bones, causes broken bones to increase as well. So there's a few different hormone treatments, but again, as, as I said, they're usually used in those um, more rarer types of ovarian cancer, not the epithelial. And then in the recurrent setting, um, treatment for ovarian cancer really, again, depends on the individual. Um, it depends on the patient's performance status or how phys physically well they are and physically active, their comorbidities or other health problems, what previous response they had um, to their treatment previously. Did they do well? Did they have many side effects? How well, um, how long did they go between the last treatment and, and, and this relapse? The duration of the response the time since previous treatment and any previous toxicities. Um, further surgery can sometimes be undertaken if there's an isolate, you know, if on CT scan there's an isolated spot of disease, whether that can be removed surgically. Um, chemotherapy um, can be used, Taxol and Platinum, also adding sometimes in another drug called Calix and of course Olaparib. Um, and as I said earlier, radiotherapy um, is often used in this case for symptom management. Um, with pain and bleeding and those types of things. So there are still options when the cancer recurs um, that I think sometimes people think that, you know, you've had one lot of treatment, it really is looking at it. And it's often taken back to the multidisciplinary team meeting where they'll look and go, okay, what was the response to chemotherapy last time? How long has that time been since the last treatment? And then really assess what other health problems are happening for the patient at the time to then make a recommendation as to um, whether they should have further chemotherapy or further surgery and whether surgery would be an option and whether they're able to remove depending on where that isolated um, spot of disease might be. So there are certainly, certainly options. And I know women who you know, have gone on to have many, many um, cycles of chemotherapy and after recurrence. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.